As Rabbi Foster mentioned, uh, we have an opportunity. Uh, we have a very special guest that we are welcoming to our congregation and here to Cleveland. Um, and thanks to Magin David Adom uh, for making it possible to Darcy, to Barry Feldman, and to your entire team. Uh, Hadas Ehrlich uh, was on the ground working. She is a Magain David paramedic, an EMS who was working on October 7th. And I'm just going to pause to say um, what Hadas is going to share with us, her firsthand experiences are very difficult to hear and traumatic. So if you don't feel that you're able to hear it at this moment, it's being recorded, so you can listen to it later. But if you don't feel comfortable being here at this moment, we want everyone just to know um, we take everyone's mental health seriously. Uh, but uh, Hadas, we are so grateful to have you in our community to tell us firsthand uh, we uh, Magain David Adom is very important to us, and I know that you are saving lives. We're literally going to hear your story. So without further ado, Hadas. Shabbat shalom, everyone. Um, my name is Hadas Ehrlich. I'm 25 years old. Um, sorry. I, I actually don't feel so comfortable talking with the mic, so okay. I'm just going to lean in, okay? Is yep. that okay? Lean in is good. Okay. So, um, my name is Hadas Ehrlich. I'm a paramedic. I'm 25 years old, and I am originally from the Jerusalem region. Now, you might ask yourself, why would a paramedic from Jerusalem treat patients down south? So, on the 7th of October, I actually started my Shabbat morning in Ofra Station, which is a small and quiet settlement in the Jerusalem area. And quickly we understood that uh, rockets have started in the south of Israel, something that is very sad, but we are used to. But very quickly we understood that this is nothing that we've ever seen before. And we were called by our dispatch to take our armored ambulance, which is a bulletproof ambulance, and start driving to Sderot. Now you would think, why would you need an armored ambulance? But that is our lives right now. So we were driving uh, to Sderot, my driver and I, and on the way we try to prepare ourselves. As I said, I'm a paramedic. I've been a paramedic for the last six years in Jerusalem. Unfortunately, we are not strangers to terror. So we try to prepare ourselves and talk to each other because we know that preparation will help us afterwards deal with everything. But quickly we understood that we cannot prepare for the images that we are going to encounter because the dispatch was going on and on about all the injured and the dead. When we got to Sderot, um, I don't know which of you have ever been to Sderot, but Sderot entrance is a long road, takes you about a minute and a half to go through. Uh, on a normal day, but that day it felt like a lifetime because when we entered the city, there were tens of civilians murdered and butchered in the streets. People that the only thing that they did harm was to wake up in their Chag and Shabbat morning wearing their Chag clothes and being murdered in the streets. Playgrounds filled with small bodies all around elderly people who woke up to go to the Dead Sea and were murdered on the bus stop. There were so many dead and that we knew that we could not attend because there was so much to do. Now you have to understand, Sirot was closed down because it was still not safe. Rockets were going on all day and also we knew that there were tens of terrorists hiding in between of the buildings. Now, as an EMT worker, and I did not say this, but I, uh, my main job in Magen David Adom today, except of being a paramedic, I'm also a head instructor of paramedic courses. And the first thing that we teach our students is safety is first. If you do not have safety, you do not treat. But this was a different case because we knew that if we were not going to enter the city, tens or hundreds were going to die. Because my armored ambulance um, is quite heavy, um, it takes us some time to drive. So Magen David Adom organized in a safer location from uh, between Sderot and the hospital 
an area with tens of ambulances from all over the country were waiting for us to take patients outside of the road. While I was going inside the road, I did not understand how, um, how and how much danger I was in. Only when I saw my phone was ringing and um, my dad, who is Shomer Shabbat, called, I understood that there was no holiness left in this day. I'm not going to tell you about all of my patients because um, in that day I did the run between Sterot and the safer location around 15 times, every time going through those bodies again and again. And the first time you notice bodies, and as I said, I'm a paramedic for six years, I've seen death, I've dealt with death, but nothing like this ever before. And so the first time you see the bodies, but the fifth time you start realizing that the woman is sitting on the bench with a cup of coffee and she was murdered in place. And you, uh, and you see a living dog the first time. You just ask yourself, why is there a living dog? And the fifth time you understand they're waiting for their owner to wake up because the only thing they did was to go de down to the street. And I remember that um, while we were driving, uh, I looked for life because as, as paramedics we want to help but. There was nothing that we could do. So actually, the, the three patients that I'm going to tell you about, they were uh, in the police station in Steroid, and I don't know which of you know, um, there was a heroic fight in that station. Through the whole day, there were um, Hamas terrorists on the roofs, snipers who were trying to fight our, uh, our forces. And uh, we are not heroes, but you have to understand these are our kids, and I say kids when I'm 25, but these are 19-year-olds fighting and protecting their friends, putting tourniquets on their limbs and keep on fighting because that is the Jewish spirit. So when we got to the police station, we understood that there are tens of injured that we cannot get to because there is still ongoing fire. But um, my driver and I, we made a deal. Uh, he heroically suggested, he said, listen, Hadas, it's not safe outside. And also we know that a place of a uh, trauma patient is in the hospital. Now, you have to understand these are patients that we could not get to for a few hours. I treated patients that were shot at 7 o'clock in the morning at 11 o'clock uh, at noon. This is death sentence when we're talking about trauma injuries. So when we got there, my driver and I said, listen, Adas, you wait in the ambulance, you get ready, and I will go down under fire and bring you patients. Now, I am not a combat medic. I did my, my paramedic studying as a national service. I've never been taught how to treat under fire. But I knew that day that in order to help these patients who've been waiting for so long, we will have to do something that we've never done before. So as I was waiting in, on the back of the ambulance getting uh, fluid ready and IV drawn and uh, blood components, plasma if you all know, um, I was waiting quietly knowing that we we're going to collect patients. So the first patient that I got uh, around 30 years old uh, from the Israeli Defense Forces, uh, around 10 of the soldiers bringing their friend unconscious on their backs, laying him down inside of my ambulance. And quickly, as I started treating my driver, who we already spoke about, evacuating as quickly as we can, went on the wheel to start driving. And I started treating the patient who is semi-conscious. He has bullet wounds who are still bleeding, and I know that he's very critically injured. And I close the doors and we keep, and I, I start treating and suddenly my doors open and I see five soldiers with another unconscious friend on their back just yelling, help us, help us. And you have to understand because my, my ambulance is armored, it's very, very narrow and I can't collect another patient. And I'm telling them, guys, I can't, I can't physically take him. They're putting their friend on top of their friend and they know that they are in danger. And I told them, guys, wait, I'll, I'll help you. And they said, you don't understand, he's going to die here. So I don't know how, but I found the strength. I, I lifted this 25-year-old with my hands and I laid him down on the floor, which was the only room that I could take care of. And I started treating both patients and going to the safer location. Uh, last week I got a picture. Um, of my critical patient hugging his wife and his daughter, which was my own victory picture. 
The last patient I'm going to tell you about um, is a patient that um, was very close to my heart that day. As I said, I treated around 15 patients, 13 patients that day, um, and more severely and less severe. But as you all know, even the less severe patients are going to need years of physical and emotional therapy. The last patient that I took was already uh, midday. We were already taking care of so many patients. We got to the police station, and as I said, my driver went down to bring patients to me. And later I understood that this patient already had a sticker on his, on his forehead with his name. Later, later we understood that that was their way to make sure that if their friends died, they would know who that was. So my driver bring, brings in this patient, around 25 to 30 years old. He's very, very pale. He's semi-conscious. He's been losing a lot of blood. Later, I understood that he's been bleeding for three to four hours. Now, if you know trauma, that is a death sentence. Afterwards, when we spoke to, to people that were there, I understood that one of the reasons that he survived till then because a woman police officer laid on top of him for three hours to apply pressure so he won't bleed out. So this patient is in my ambulance. He is semi-conscious as I start uh, fighting for his life. My driver has already started driving to the safest location. And I call this patient's name. And, and through the, the oxygen mask, very weakly, he tells me his name. And I understand that these are going to be his last moments because he is so severely injured. So he tells me his name. And I keep on treating him. And he holds my hand while I'm taking care of and he looks me in the eyes and saying, am I going to live? You have to understand as paramedics, we, we work very automatically. We don't allow our emotions to interrupt in these moments. Although I'm a very empathetic, sympathetic and emotional person, in those moments we do not think we work because we know that every bit of our strength has to go to our patients. But in that moment, that split moment when he held my hand and asked if he's going to live, I allowed this shield unintentionally to open. And, and for a split of a moment, I saw his wife and his daughter, and, and I knew that I could not assure him life. I could not because I knew that those could be his last moments. But I didn't want to lie, but I did want to remain his hope. So I looked him in the eye and said, listen, I'm going to do everything in my power to help you and to assure you're going to live. And those are the words that I did believe. We kept on going, and on the way, he almost um, uh, lost consciousness three times. And I don't know if you know, but a trauma patient who is awake is a patient who's fighting. And if he's not conscious, he is not fighting for himself. And if he's not fighting for himself, he cannot breathe. And if he cannot breathe, I have to help. And if I have to help, him, it means that that will be the end. So on the way, when he started uh, losing consciousness, I, I called his name and I said, hey, listen, we're going to make a deal, you and I. I actually used a little bit of humor because I knew that those could be his last moments. So I said, listen, we're going to make a deal, you and I, okay? You use every strength you have to stay awake, and I'll do everything in my power to help you live. As I said, he almost lost consciousness three times, so every time I said, hey, with a smile, you stay awake. One time he actually called me annoying, which I think, I think he, um, he ended up forgiving me. But uh, during that ride, around three times, I said, listen, you promised me you're going to stay awake. And when I transferred him to the other ambulance, I also told Yo, the paramedic, said, yo, listen, this guy, he promised me. So just make sure he, he respects the end of his deal. And I truly thought that those were his last moments because your the other paramedic said, listen, Hadas, when we arrived to the hospital, we could not get a, a blood pressure. His pulse was in the roof. I think that those were his last moments. About a week and a half later, I get a message from an unknown number saying, hi, my name is this and that. You treated my brother. Do you remember his name? And as I said, his name, the moment that he said, steep into my heart, and I said, of course, and I was sure that she was going to send me funeral information but she said my brother is awake he survived he remembers you he remembers your deal and he's in a lot of pain but he's alive that day was pure evil I've never seen anything like it I don't think that 
uh, emotionally and physically and in body and mind we were prepared what i can i can say that during that day i was so proud being a part of magenda vidadoma i was so proud being a, a Jewish paramedic and a woman paramedic in, in Magenda Vidadom because I saw how we fought and how we risked our lives. And I'm not a hero, but we do have 11 uh, friends and colleagues who lost their lives, um, EMT drivers who were shot in their own ambulance, uh, EMT drivers that the wheels were shot so they could not evacuate patients. This was pure evil. I'm going to end on a strengthening note because you have to see the unity that we uh, are feeling in our country. Um, and a lot of, of the rabbis here said that uh, the Holocaust, and um, I know that after the Holocaust, so many Jews were so afraid to be Jewish, they changed their names, and generations of Jews were wiped out because people were afraid to be Jewish. And when I got here to the States and we were in the rally in the heart of New York, and I felt the pride and I said, this will never happen again. We are pride. We are proud to be Jewish. Our heads are held up high. And we are not apologizing for being Jewish. And I can tell you that uh, when I was asked to, to come here, not, of course, not, uh, in a bad way, but I said is this is the most important thing that I can do right now because my friends are fighting and my family's fighting and and the moment that I got here I understood how much how much it was important because every Jewish person that approaches me says listen a part of my heart is in Israel and we do not know what to do so I want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart for all your support because we do feel it and you're the reason that we can keep doing what we're doing. And I was very fortunate that day that all of my patients, even the severe ones, survived. But a lot of my friends were not that lucky. Um, so thank you for everything you do for our community and our, um, and our organization. We feel your help. And I know that this, uh, this synagogue um, is trying to, to raise money to bring an ambulance. And I just want to say thank you from the bottom of our hearts because although emotionally and physically we were not prepared, Magen David Adom, I promise you, was prepared. You should have seen the work. It was beautiful. Um, we, we lost friends. We lost colleagues. And as Eli Bin, our, 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 our boss, uh, said very, very beautifully and, and very, very tragically, our paramedics were found murdered with the gloves still on their hands. We are not combat medics, but we are doing our job in these horrible times. And I just wanted to say thank you and be proud that you're Jewish because we as Jewish people need to stay united right now. So just I want to say thank you and Shabbat Shalom. May we see better days. Bezrat Hashem. Das, you're a hero. You're a hero. And for all the first responders, Magin David Adom, we love you, our hearts are with you.